Right. We are live. Welcome to, well, at least for me, it's a fairly sunny 1230 p.m. on a Thursday, July 13th, 2023. Super excited to have you all here for our Vet Girl YouTube live event. And I'm, I'm really excited about this topic because I can tell you that pancreatitis as a criticalist is something that we deal with all the time. And it's one of those things that it's challenging, right? There's no uh, previously a cure or antidote and supportive care and some can linger on. So this is an amazing topic that I'm super excited to hear about. If this is your first YouTube live event, welcome. If it's not your first YouTube live event with Becquerel, you know the drill. I want you to type in where you are logging in from, from around the country and around the world. Me, I should introduce myself. I'm Garrett Pactinger. I'm the co-founder of Vecrol and a criticalist, as I said. As I look out my window here, fairly sunny but warm Pennsylvania. Justine, where are you logging in from? I'm seeing some fellow Minnesotans on uh, today's YouTube chat, so I'm super excited. I'm based out of St. Paul, Minnesota, and it's supposed to be 86 degrees, and uh, all the Minnesotans are melting, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm in really AC in a sweatshirt, so. <laughs> and then really excited, we have Dr. Cridge. Dr. Cridge, where are you logging in from today? Logging in from East Lansing, Michigan. East Lansing, Michigan, an amazing place. And I, I said to Dr. Cridge, it's really exciting because we have our friends and our fans and our attendees that come from all over the world. As I scroll through, please go ahead and type it in. As I, I promised Dr. Cridge, we have our friends from Portugal here with us today. Northern California, Denver, Vermont. Oh, I hope you're safe in Vermont. I know, again, I'm in Pennsylvania, that upper Northeast. You guys are getting that crazy rain, so stay safe. Kentucky, Minnesota, Indiana, more Minnesota. Yeah, Justine, there you go. Kansas, California, Virginia, South Carolina. Oh, as Justine said, we love our international attendees. Boston, Arkansas, De Texas. Oh, hot in Texas, right? So hope everyone's staying cool. Please continue to type in where you're logging in from. We absolutely love reading it. It makes us totally happy to see that. But as you're typing in, I'm going to get the party started here today for our YouTube Live. We're going to be talking about pancreatitis in dogs, new insights and impacts on our clinical practice. We always try to be clinically relevant and practical. And I did want to give a huper, huper, that's huge and super together. I just created a word, a huper shout out to Siva. Siva has been an amazing educational partner with VetGirl. We're going to see them at VetGirl U. We have a cool and exciting project planned with Siva. So, Huber, big shout out to Siva. Thank you so much for being here with us today. They're an amazing partner and allowed us to provide this completely complimentary worldwide race approved CE YouTube live event. So, thank you, Siva, for being here with us today and being a Huber partner with us. As I said, this is race approved, all right? But this is really, really important. How are you going to get your race approved CE? Justine already put the link in our YouTube channel, but here's how you do it. Firstly, okay, there is a link right on the page. So if you type into your browser, tinyurl.com forward slash VG for Veckerl, and then today's date, 7-13-23, it'll open up a registration form you must fill out to get your CE certificate. If you have your fancy smartphone, if you open it up to your camera, and go ahead and put the camera, just look at that QR code, a little yellow button comes up, you click on that yellow button, and it takes you to that same exact registration page. Justine also put it, if you want to copy and paste it from our YouTube channel, we are going to leave this open until 30 minutes after the session is over. So the session is from about 12.30 to 1 p.m. Eastern. At 1.30 p.m. Eastern, we're going to close that. We will remind you at the end of the session, and Justine will add it to the YouTube channel chat if you want to copy and paste it. But this is the only way to get your CE credit for the live and interactive event. Other cool things about YouTube. So if you are watching this on a phone or desktop, that tiny little open square on the bottom right, if you click on that, it will make it the full screen. So you can watch us even larger, not just that small YouTube window. We hope you're interacting with us more than just on YouTube. We have so many amazing things on our Vecral online platform, including our certificate programs, where we now have 11 certificates to help you become more proficient in an area of your interest. And this is absolutely included in your vet girl membership. So we please, I, I'm begging you, take advantage of it. I promise it is worth it. You will become more proficient in an area, whether it's anesthesia, ophthalmology, emergency medicine, nutrition, Take a look at our certificate programs. 
If you're not a Vecril member yet, check out our Vecril trial membership. We just updated our trial membership to really give you almost full, complete, on-demand access to our entire library for 14 days. No, you can't take on-demand CE as a trial member, but you can watch all of our stuff, get a sense of our style. We know you're going to love it, and we hope you do then become a full Vecril member to take full advantage of all that we offer. Oh, Vecril, you, I am so excited about this. In just about a month, oh my God, in just about a month, we are going to be in beautiful, sunny Scottsdale, Arizona for Vet Girl U 2023. If you have been on the fence and you're saying, ah, should I go? Should I not? You should. And let me tell you, please don't delay. I think we only may have one or two, if at most, seats left in our technician track and not many seats left in our veterinarian track before we're completely sold out. So don't delay. If you're interested, please sign up ASAP before you get locked out and we hope to see you there. With that said, I know you're not here to listen to us, myself and Justine, although you you like us, I hope. We're here to listen to Dr. Cridge. We want to know all that is good and new with pancreatitis. So Dr. Cridge, we know you're in East Lansing, but if you can give our audience a little bit of a background of what you normally do, how you love practicing, and then please take it away. The floor is yours. And again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, I'm really excited to, to be here today. So thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm a faculty member at Michigan State University. Um, and I'm an ACVM and ECVM board certified uh, specialist in small and low internal medicine. Um, and I have a real passion and interest in disorders of the exocrine pancreas. So that brings, brings us into what we're going to talk about today. So to orient you to our discussion today, we're going to have a brief discussion of what pancreatitis is and why it offers us so many challenges as clinicians. We're then gonna to touch on some of our new insights into clinical practice and how, what this might, means to us as clinicians. So as we all know, pancreatitis is an inflammatory disorder of the exocrine pancreas. While we don't know the exact prevalence, we all know that this is a particularly common cause of gastrointestinal upset in practice. And there's evidence in necropsy studies and in various insurance data that shows us that this is particularly common. Despite its common occurrence, it is associated with a high morbidity and a high mortality. So the next thing is, why is pancreatitis so challenging to us? And this is predominantly focused in two main areas. Firstly, there's no well agreed upon um, gold standard single test for the diagnosis of pancreatitis in dogs. So we as clinicians are reliant on our clinical intuition in addition to evaluation of a patient's history, physical exam, imaging findings, and a pancreatic lipase assay to make this diagnosis. Once we've made this diagnosis and we've ruled out other causes of related clinical signs, we have to think about our treatment. And until recently, we've been restricted to supportive and symptomatic care, and that has unfortunately been associated with fairly poor outcomes. And this brought us um, as clinicians and researchers to think about what are the causes of pancreatitis, what is going on, and ultimately, are there any pathways in pancreatitis that we can target therapeutically to have a beneficial effect on our patients? And this is what is discussed in this um, open access review article we recently published in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine. And we're going to be focusing on a few things from this article as we move through the rest of this presentation. So in order to identify new treatment options for pancreatitis, we really have to think about how the disease works. And for many of us, this brings us back to uh, vet school and thoughts about the, the co-localization theory. And while this provides a lot of information on pancreatitis, there's a little bit further information we're gonna discuss on the next slides. But before we get there, let's take a few moments to recap on the co-localization theory and what it means for our patients with pancreatitis. So on the left of the side, we have normal physiology. And on the right of the side, we have pathology. So in normal physiologic conditions, we have digestive zymogens, which is mainly trypsinogen. And these are inactive digestive enzymes that are made by the pancreas and they're ultimately released and they only become active in the small intestine. However, during pancreatitis, which is the right-hand side of the screen, we get something called an apical block. And ultimately, what that means is these zymogens, which are uh, inactive, come together or co-localize with these lysosomes, 
And these digestive enzymes, predominantly trypsinogen, are then prematurely activated within the pancreas. And what that means for us is instead of digesting food in the intestine, these digestive enzymes are breaking down the, the pancreatic cells, causing inflammation and necrosis, all of which we see in pancreatitis. However, in 2011, a group of researchers at the University of Minnesota published a study that really showed us that there was a little bit more to our understanding of pancreatitis than we initially suspected. So in this study, they used an experimental model of pancreatitis based on various mouse models. There were normal healthy mice, so wild type mice, and there were also a selected population of genetically deficient mice which were deficient in trypsinogen, or those premature digestive enzymes. And ultimately, what they did is they gave an injection to each of these population of mice, and they looked to see what would happen in pancreatitis if trypsinogen was deficient. So when we look at graph A and D, we can look at whether these animals experience inflammation and necrosis, respectively. And the really interesting finding in the study was that those mice that were deficient in trypsinogen, which is the key focus of that co-localization theory, they were still able to have significant amounts of inflammation. Additionally, these mice had up to 40% of the necrosis as the normal healthy mice. So even in the absence of trypsinogen, we were able to have pancreatic inflammation, and we we're also able to have pancreatic necrosis. And this brings us on to where we are next, which is on the next slide. So now this is our understanding of the pathophysiology of pancreatitis. And admittedly, it is very complex and we don't need to go into the specific details today. But ultimately, I am gonna try and orient you to this diagram with the focuses on the red circle and the green circle. So in the red circle, there are various different um, pathophysiologic events that occur in the pancreatic cells. And ultimately, these cause activation of that trypsinogen, that digestive enzymes, or independent, trypsin independent mechanisms, all triggering inflammation, which is shown on the right hand side. So, as clinicians and researchers, if we were able to modulate anything in the red or anything in the green, it has the potential of benefiting our patients. One of the things that we looked at at Michigan State was to look at oxidative stress in these animals. Now, oxidative stress is a balance between the concentration of various reactive metabolites, these chemicals that cause oxidative damage, and how they relate to the body's natural antioxidants. So ultimately, oxidative stress is a balance between these reactive metabolites and these antioxidants. And what we were able to show in a population of 19 dogs compared to a population of health, sorry, nine healthy controls was that dogs with pancreatitis, as shown in figure A, had a higher levels of these reactive metabolites, these um, chemicals that cause oxidative damage. Additionally, we showed that the balance between reactive metabolites and antioxidants was increased in our pancreatitis cases. So ultimately, we proved that dogs with pancreatitis did undergo oxidative stress. And this is a uh, potential indication to do a clinical trial, with the caveat that we did not see strong correlations with outcome data. So there we just talked about one example of where we as clinicians and researchers could target something in the red and ultimately see what the outcome on the patient is. Alternatively, and what is done with Panacroix, is we could target one of the inflammatory pathways on the right-hand side with the hope that reducing inflammation would reduce the risk of clinically evident disease and the severity of pancreatitis, independent of which of the cellular mechanisms in the red occurred. We all know that neutrophils are a key part of the inflammatory response in pancreatitis. And in order for the neutrophils to get into the tissues, they follow various chemoattractants. And this ultimately is dependent on the rolling, activation, adhesion, and migration of these neutrophils from the blood vessel into the tissues. Now, one of the key players in the movement of these cells 
is something called leukocyte function associated antigen 1, which is indicated by LFA1 in the center of your screen on the surface of the neutrophil. What LFA1 does is it interacts with a certain um, receptor on the, the blood vessel called ICAM1, and that's what allows it to move from the vessel into the tissues. Now, fusoplatin, which is Panaquil, inhibits this leukocyte function antigen 1. And ultimately, what that does is it prevents these neutrophils from coming from the capillary and into the tissues. So the next obvious question for us as clinicians is, if the neutrophils are depleted, do we have any evidence that this would be beneficial for our patients? So one of the, the pieces of evidence behind this was an experimental model of pancreatitis that was published in the Journal of Cell, Cellular Physiology and Biochemistry in 2015. And ultimately what they did is they depleted neutrophils from a population of mice and then they induced pancreatitis. And those mice that had depleted neutrophils had lower concentrations of pancreatic biomarkers, they had less tissue damage, they have less reactive oxygen species, those things we talked about earlier in those slides, and they had less evidence of systemic organ dysfunction. So at least in this population of experimentally induced pancreatitis, we have evidence that neutrophil, benef neutrophil depletion may be beneficial for our patients. And this ultimately brings us to, to Panaquil, which is gonna be a strong focus of our brief discussion today. So Panaquil CA1, is the first conditionally FDA approved drug for the management of clinical signs associated with pancreatitis in dogs. What conditional approval means is that it has um, been shown to the FDA that this drug has been shown to be safe and has a reasonable expectation for efficacy. And this approval was granted in November of 2022. And we have foreign market experience with this drug in Japan since 2018. The next question we have to ask ourselves is how did we get to where we are today? And ultimately, this is the, the accumulation of a lot of work uh, by people that were interested in getting this drug to market. One of the studies that was done was a dose determination study. And all of these studies are available to clinicians through the Freedom of Information Summary for the application for conditional approval of Panaquil CA1 powder for injection on the FDA website. So this is available to everybody. For the dose determination study, they used an experimental model of pancreatitis and they gave dogs various different doses of this drug. Zero milligrams per kilogram or no Panaquil, 0.4 milligrams per kilogram and 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. And ultimately what they saw was that 0.4 and 4 milligrams per kilo were equally effective. So they selected the lowest effective dose of 0.4 milligrams per kilo. And this is what went the, into the following studies. The next study that was done is something called a field effectiveness study. And this was done between July 2017 and September 2019 across 11 sites. Ultimately, 61 dogs were enrolled and 36 of those dogs completed all parts of the study and were therefore available for evaluation of efficacy. 17 of those dogs received fusoplatin, also known as Panaquil, and 19 of those dogs were in the control group. Those in the Panaquil group received the 0.4 milligrams per kilo from the last study, intravenously once a day for three days. And the study looked at various different outcomes um, versus a control population. The one that we're gonna focus on today is the one called MCI, or the Modified Canine Activity Index. And this is ultimately what was used to achieve conditional FDA approval. What the MCI is, it's a clinical severity indicator. And ultimately what it is, it's a measure of all the things we look for in our clinical patients to work out how bad is this pancreatitis. It's a combination of looking at the patient's activity levels, their appetite, whether they're vomiting, whether they have cranial abdominal pain, whether they are dehydrated, and ultimately some properties of the stool, including stool consistency, and whether they have blood in the stool. They did also report that they recorded concentrations of systemic inflammatory biomarkers, like C-reactive protein. They also measured 
uh, pancreatic lipase concentrations and cytokine concentrations. But as mentioned previously, the modified Keenan activity index is what we're going to focus on today because ultimately that is what was used to obtain that um, conditional approval. So this is the data from that Freedom of Information Summary. And what we can see here is we're controlling the group of dogs, the 17 dogs that received Panaquil or Fusoplidib sodium compared to the control population. And what we can see here is that there was a greater reduction in the modified K9 activity index, minus, minus 7.7, .7, compared to the control population. And that was statistically significant. But what that means to us as clinicians is these animals that received the Fusoplidib, the Panaquil, got better faster than those animals that received just the vehicle control. Now we know what Panaquil is, how it works, and that it has been shown to improve the clinical signs associated with the acute onset of pancreatitis in dogs, we do have to think about are there any potential adverse effects? Now with any drug, there are always the potential. Any of these adverse effects noted here could be attributed to the underlying disease condition or the drug. And that is why we really need to look at the frequency of these in the, the Fusoplidib or the Panaquil group compared to the control group. So as you can see here, dogs in both groups did have anorexia and um, what they classified as digestive tract disorders. And this included um, things like regurgitation, vomiting, and nausea. So we did see those in both populations and we do see those in dogs with pancreatitis. We did also see some respiratory tract disorders. And when we read the fine print, this is animals that had developed pneumonia or had dyspnea or tachypnea. And again, that was seen in both populations. Other things that were reported included the development of hepatopathy or jaundice, again, in both populations. Um, and there was various other adverse events that were reported. Again, here is some additional data that was reported in that Freedom of Information Summary and on the Panaquil Interactive Detailer online. The next thing we can do to look at the efficacy or the safety of this drug is to not only look at what adverse events happened in those trials, but is also to look at the data from the Target Animal Species Safety Study. So this was a study that occurred more recently, so this was March 2021 to November 2021. And here they took beagles and they gave them five times over overdoses of the drug and they also gave it for three times longer than the label dose. So this is looking at what happens when doses are given too high or for too long. And again, we're controlling those, comparing those animals that receive Fusoplatib or Panaquil to the control group. Hypersalivation was reported in both groups. Uh, one dog in the Panaquil group did have injection site pain, um, but this was attributed to a catheter issue. There were some um, injection site swelling seen in both groups with a higher frequency in the five times overdose group. And hypertension was reported um, in one in eight dogs with a standard dose. Um, again, in the three times overdose group, but when we give things as high as five times high, um, up to four out of eight dogs were noted to have hypertension. So now we know what the drug is, how it works, um, the data on efficacy, and some of the adverse effects. We need to know how we're gonna give this drug to our patients. So Panaquil CA1 or Fusoplatib sodium is reconstituted to four mg per mil with a sterile diluent provided. And it remains stable in the fridge in a multi-dose vial for up to 28 days. It's dosed at that 0.4 milligrams per kilogram or 0.1 mils per kilo of dark um, based on that dose determination and field efficacy study. And we give it once a day intravenously for three days. And as with any drug, we have to monitor for adverse effects. There are some occasions where SIVA recommends that we avoid um, the use of this drug and that includes dogs less than six months of age, and that is because that population was not included in any of those field trials, and also any dogs that have a known reaction or hypersensitivity to fusoplatib in its history. One of the really important things to remember is that Panaquel 
um, is used as an adjunctive agent to improve those clinical signs. But ultimately, we do have to give it in conjunction with both supportive and symptomatic care. And this is comprised of fluids, depending on the patient's hydration status, the presence of comorbid diseases, and ongoing losses, antiemetics, such as moropitin and ondansetron, pain relief, which is critically important in these patients, and of course, nutrition. So we're going to take a couple moments to mention the importance of nutrition in these cases over the next couple slides. So nutrition can be provided to these patients in many ways. My personal favorite method is uh, via nasogastric tube because it's uh, relatively inexpensive and it, they become relatively easy to place after you have a little experience. And there are many benefits of providing nutrition via the GI tract to critically ill patients. This includes decreasing the amount of ileus and inflammation. It can also stimulate intestinal mucosal growth and regeneration, and it can decrease protein catabolism. So we're gonna to go to the next slide. Now we also know that we have beneficial effects of nutrition in our particular dogs with pancreatitis group. This was a study that was published in the Journal of Veterinary Emergency Critical Care in 2017. And what they showed was that dogs that received um, nutrition by the GI tract within 48 hours of hospitalization had faster returns to voluntary food intake and decreased GI adverse effects relative to those that again supporting um, the introduction of nutrition ill in the management of these diseases. So to summarize what we've quickly reviewed today, we have an increasing knowledge on the underlying causes of pancreatitis. We talked about trypsin-dependent mechanisms such as co-localization, but we also talked about the fact that there are trypsin-independent mechanisms. We talked about the fact that Increased knowledge of the causes of pancreatitis has led to growing opportunities for the development of targeted therapies. These therapies could target that red circle, which are specific mechanisms of disease, such as oxidative stress, with the ultimate hope that it benefits the patient at the end of the day. Alternatively, we can target more generalized inflammatory pathways, and this is the route that fusoplatib sodium or Panaquel takes in the management of cases. We learned that Panaquel is a leukocyte function associated antigen 1 inhibitor. And ultimately, that reduces the movement of neutrophils from the, the blood vessels into the tissues. We also learned that while Panaquel has been shown to benefit patients by improving the clinical signs associated with the acute onset of pancreatitis, we give it in conjunction with both supportive and symptomatic care. That may include fluid therapy, antiemetics analgesics, and of course, nutrition. So with that, we will open the floor to any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Fantastic information. And I know I personally have heard a lot of questions about Panaquil. So love the information and the research behind it. Uh, for those of you guys, I already put this in the chat multiple times, but if you have not seen it, please make sure to fill out the form. I'm putting it in the chat one more time right now. Uh, you have to fill this out within the next 22 minutes in uh, 30 minutes, 32 minutes to get your CE certificate. And that's for half an hour of live free CE, all thanks to SIVA. So again, please make sure to fill out this form. Uh, if you're watching this later, um, you're more than welcome to watch it and share it with your team. Uh, but again, they are not eligible for CE unless you're a Vector Elite member. Um, now, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. We'll try to get through what we can. And again, just wanted to give a huge thank you to Dr. Cridge and again to SIVA for sponsoring today's YouTube live event so we can provide this free to you guys so you can learn over lunchtime or breakfast or dinner or wherever you are in the world. And again, love seeing the international audience on this. All right, I'm seeing a couple of questions in here. Now, um, any ongoing studies or development of drugs to inhibit those digestive enzymes that you know of? Yeah, so I think, I think one of the, the things to talk about here is this, this particular drug is all about reducing that neutrophil movement into the tissues. Um, I have used it uh, personally with, with some good beneficial effect. Um, there are studies going on across the whole range of the, the mechanisms of disease and inhibiting various different things. I'm not aware of any active studies right now looking at 
specifically the digestive enzymes. Most of the things that I have seen has been focused on, you know, those underlying mechanisms like oxidative stress or focusing on general inflammation rather than on the actual digestive enzyme themselves. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I see another question. Is um, quilt specific for the pancreas or can it be used for other locations? I know it's, um, I don't know if you have uh, information on that. Yeah, so I think I think what we know is certainly from the conditional FDA approval and the label, this is used for the clinical signs associated with pancreatitis. Now, when we look at its disease mechanism, it's all about inhibiting that neutrophil migration. So there's nothing to say that it is specific for um, pancreatitis, um, but that is what the label is currently. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, do you know what the half-life of the drug is or where people can find more information? Yeah, so there's certainly more information on, on the, the SIVA website with the Panaquil. We've got more information on the Freedom of Information Summary. Um, but the drug is given uh, once a day, and the data um, from that's come out so far and is publicly available shows improvements from the first day of that injection. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I went ahead and put uh, some more information uh, directly into the chat. But if you are looking for more information, you go, go to SIVAConnect.com slash internal medicine. So definitely want to check that out also. Um, does it, do you know how to reconstitute it? Like, uh, I know a lot of those details will be on that website and also on the uh, drug handout, but is it mixed with sterile saline versus water? Is it slow injection IV uh, over one minute? Do you, do you have any information on that? Yeah, so it's, um, it comes with a sterile diluent provider. Um, so it's a 14 milligram uh, bottle and it's diluted to four mix per mil. Um, and then the other, what was the other question, sorry? Oh, just that, uh, just if it could be diluted. Yeah. Um, and then how rapidly or slowly it needs to be given? Is it over one minute, over, you know, 10 minutes? Yes, yeah, it's, it's given slowly IV. And the, the specific instructions are on, on the little insert in the back end. Wonderful. And I'm actually excited for all of you guys who can keep a secret out there. We are actually releasing a Panaquil wheel and it has great information on the other side. It's actually a dehydration calculator. So you definitely want to check that out. It's actually releasing a Vet Girl U. So for those of you guys who are, who are going to Scottsdale to enjoy the seven pools at uh, the bougie uh, Fairmont Hotel, uh, the Fairmont Princess in Scottsdale, uh, you'll be able to get your wheel there. So super excited for that sponsorship. Um, in that opportunity. All right. I see one or two other questions. Um, one question is, and this is extra label, so I'm not sure if you can answer it, but can this new drug also be used in other cases like peritonitis, or you're not sure if it's pancreatitis, you don't have ultrasound, you can't diagnose it. Um, has it been evaluated in those situations? Yeah. So again, going back to the specific, you know, approval on what the FDA say we can, we can use it for is fully associated with the clinical signs of, of pancreatitis. But I think one of the things that we have to, to think about is the way that this drug has been approved is based on that modified Q9 activity. So it's all about the clinical signs associated with pancreatitis. So those signs are going to improve when you give this drug. I think for me as a clinician, the most important thing is going to be ruling out things that require anything other than medical therapy. So ruling out those foreign bodies and anything else that can cause the vomiting. Um, but after, after that, um, you know, it, it potentially could be beneficial. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Again, uh, you know, I would say as a criticalist, it's easy to diagnose pancreatitis because they have amazing radiologists around me who can be like, oh yeah, it's pancreatitis. I don't do ultrasound myself. Um, so always appreciative of all the uh, internists who are ultrasounding and the radiologists. Uh, with that, we just, we just wanted to say thank you again to everybody for showing up for today's talk, to Dr. Cridge for the wonderful information, and again to Siva for being able to provide this YouTube live free to everyone. Without their sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to make this happen. So the next time you see your Siva rep, or you're at a conference, please make sure to stop by their booth. And you can also pick up that awesome, amazing new wheel uh, that will be out in a month. And with that, again, just wanted to thank everyone again. Don't forget to fill out that form. I put it in the chat multiple times. I'll put it in one more time just for fun. Um, but make sure to uh, fill that out. That's going to close in 26 minutes and you lose your ability to, to earn that free CE. Okay. So it has to be watched live. Uh, with that, I also wanted to thank all of you guys for what you do. Uh, we don't always get that thank you and uh, just really appreciate everything that you guys are doing in whatever aspect that you're working in, whether or not it's shelter medicine, emergency, general practice, you guys are rocking it.
And with that, we will see you guys at the next YouTube Live or in person in 27 days in uh, Scottsdale. And again, Dr. Cridge, thank you so much again. Thank you so much.